All right, welcome everybody. So we're gonna be moving into organics um, for the next couple of weeks in this class. And um, organics are really, really important. And they're often, what I've noticed is in uh, myself being an artist and coming from certain drawing classes, right? Usually you're drawing what I call hard edged items. So uh, still, you're drawing still lifes of boxes and other elements. And organics is sort of a whole another beast because what's really nice is when you get to look at organic structure, it's something that's been created by nature. And if you pick up a little bit about how to sketch them, it takes you to this wonderful place where you can do something that other people can't do. And also, in uh, you know, this is a basic drawing for entertainment arts class. In the field of entertainment arts, okay, a really popular, like three different areas that employ people. One is background design and environment design. Another one is storyboarding, okay. In those two particular areas, a lot of times you're having to draw organics and characters inside jungles and trees. And there's a certain way to do that and produce it. And if you incorporate this into your draftsmanship skill set, you become a stronger artist, okay. And the other thing that's really cool too is in Photoshop, you could uh, produce a bunch of silhouette studies of organics and bring them in as custom shapes. And that's actually a way to paint digitally. Um, I could do a demo for you one day. I already think I have another demo or two up. Or in Photoshop, you could literally create, you know, these cutouts of trees and plants. You can turn them into brushes or custom shapes, and it really expedites part of your workflow. So luckily, what I have here, oops, I didn't mean to close that window. What I want to do is before we, be, be, we begin, I want to show you the art of this awesome gentleman, um, Paul Felix, okay? And when, I should actually just go over here, we'll go to the unofficial blog site. Paul never really puts his work up, but a couple people that I know that know him have taken some of his work and they put it up. So Paul is a visual development artist at uh, a Disney Feature Animation. And he sort of changed the course of that studio because way back in the day, um, in the Mulan days is when he pretty much started, he started sketching characters inside his environments, telling stories, just like you see down here on Lilo and Stitch. And um, Paul um, was actually a really, really super talented guy. He, he actually went to Harvard and was studying business and economics. And um, I actually know his brother, Phil, and he used to take some classes with Phil and stuff. And then one day, Paul decided to come back out here and uh, decided after graduating from Harvard, he loved to draw and he just decided to get involved with animation. And he started off at Deke working on like Inspector Gadget, some other shows, doing uh, cleanup. And then he sort of migrated his way. And one of the really cool things when you look at a lot of work from Paul is there's a nice flowing softness in it. And some of that also comes from his understanding on how to draw and group organics, okay? So this is why it's really, really important for me to bring this up to you now and, and introduce it to you because if you look at how Paul's working and you look at how he clumps bushes together and how he, he thinks about his construction of organics, it really helps you in figuring out how to piece together and draw your own. And actually, I was really lucky enough when I was a student, when I got out of school, Paul was teaching with another guy named Jim Schlenker, who's another Disney artist. And I got to go take a class from them. And um, I have some of Paul's notes on organics on our class blog that I'm gonna give to you guys that you get to look at. So it was really cool. And those are some of his notes right there. And I actually have some of these already put up and I thought I'd share these with you. It's really cool because one of the things that he does is Paul talks about organics being in either like core shapes, like cylinders and spheres, or he talks about them almost acting like blankets, like it's a piece of a blanket flowing over tree branches. Does that make sense? That way yeah. you're creating more shape and form and it's sort of coming alive. And if you look at over here, you can see what I'm talking about, where he's talking about think of mid-ground foliage as flat planes. So they're almost like melted pancakes overlapping each other. And what really happens with that, I shouldn't say pancakes, but it's like really thin pieces of paper that's sort of pliable folding over each other, right? What happens with that is it allows you to see, in terms of contrast, a light side and a dark side, okay? And that right there is one of the biggies that really identifies planes and trees because you have certain planes 
of the tree that are getting hit by light, and then you have stuff on the inside of the tree that's going to be dark. So you're actually setting up a dark against light contrast, and that's what creates part of the visual reads. Okay, so Paul pretty much is a genius at what he does, and I think a lot of the shows that he worked on, he really, really inspired a lot of people uh, with the way that he was treating organics. He was one of the first artists when he was working on Lilo and Stitch and Tarzan. I mean, he was just producing these like beautiful images. And the crazy thing about this is, you see this image right here and that? Those are thumbnails. They're this big. He does a lot of these drawings at that size. And he just sits there and just noodles and puts little details in there. So you don't always have to draw like super duper large. You don't have to overestimate your subject matter. And it's okay to start for you guys to do that. One of the things we're going to do today is I'm going to draw a, a horizon line, draw a grid. One of the secrets of drawing organics, there's a couple. One of them is starting from the ground up where we start on a grid plane and then we draw our trees and our bushes coming from the ground going upwards. A lot of people tend to do it the other way. They tend to start from the top of the tree. And by doing that, they get a little lost on understanding how a tree or a plant anchors down to the ground. And, if, and when you do that, that's one of the problems is it doesn't feel anchored. So it makes the tree or the bush or the plant look like it's sort of floating and it doesn't look right. Okay. So I want to mention this name because I can go back and put some more of his images up. Or if you want, you can come over here to the unofficial Paul Felix blog and you can take a look at a lot of his work that he's done. And to me, it's just great to see because you get to see somebody who really has an understanding of, of just staging, perspective, placing characters in, understanding contrast, knowing how to... There's a term we use when we get to rendering called pushing and pulling of shapes and value. So to pull something forward, we lighten it. To push something down, we darken it. So he'll create little dark spots like this, okay? And then he'll have little areas be white because then the white is going to pop forward, right? So that's the way that we draw a bush or the way that we draw a series of plants. So when we go back and we start taking a look at some of the beautiful stuff that he's done, here's one of my favorite pieces um, when he's working on Tarzan. Notice all the organics in there coming in, the tree coming in. The, the other great thing about organics is it's organic, it's living, it's life. So when you add that to a drawing and you have vines or plants in, it's changing the viewers sort of focus and feel on how they're interpreting the art, right? So anytime you can avoid, I always talk about this in my design class, is this, a 90. So when you get to like environment design or character design or even a Maya design class, this is a 90 degree angle. 90 degree angles aren't always fun. They're what we start off when we start drawing buildings and shapes and other elements. But anytime we could come in and break a 90 by putting vines on it, by putting a plant next to it, anytime we introduce an organic like that, you'll notice a little trick that we do sometimes is we tend to introduce organics in corners. So if you look here, corner, corner, and then there might be, there's nothing right here. But if you start looking at a bunch of work, you'll start noticing, you know, the indication of trees and a couple little rocks or bushes. Organic flows are removing from here and we're coming down inside the composition. Isn't that a beautiful piece, by the way? That right there is one of the things that set him apart from everybody else back in the mid-90s is he was drawing, he was doing basically combining layout design, storyboarding, and then there's another term they used to have called workbooking. Workbooking is when you took a detailed environment with characters and drew it, but then you indicated where the light source was coming from, and then you indicated usually like what was happening in the scene and what was the action. And that's what Paul was really good at. Do you remember the scene in Tarzan? When Tarzan finally confronts you know, if I were to say, hey, where's the lead ape out of this? You know that that's him right there. He's the biggest area of contrast. So there's so much you can learn from somebody like Paul Felix because, I mean, he's a dedicated pro and he spent a huge part of his, of his drawing in life understanding simplicities of staging and just draftsmanship. And when I took his class, he used to tell us, like, just draw. Go home. Draw your house. Draw from multiple views. Draw props. Draw, draw, draw. The whole part of the, the business and the industry is for you guys to become very efficient in understanding how to sketch and how to draw. Okay. Then one of the things that happened with Paul is I think once his draftsmanship got up to this upper level, he started getting involved with color. 
and you started painting inside his environment. And then I think you started sort of slow, but you got to this, I think this is for uh, American Dog, which became Bolt, okay? And uh, this was development work for that, where he's drawing part of his environments and he's going in there at the same time and he's staging characters and he's adding <laughs> color and shadows and he's giving you an idea of what's happening in part of the scene. Okay, let me see what else we have on. There's a little picture of Paul right there, sketching. And when you meet him, he's literally like, he's like, hi, yeah. He's like super quiet, very humble. That's why he never really posts his work. My buddy John Navarez decided to create this site and grabbed a bunch of Paul's work. And he goes, if you're not gonna put your work up. So think about it. Paul's like one of the top guys at Disney, still there for years. And he doesn't even have a website or portfolio because people know who he is. And he doesn't even put his work up. He's just very humble and he's very quiet. And, and then we were like, hey, Paul, we're going to grab your stuff and put it up. And he could be seen by people. Okay. Um, and then Paul sort of hit this phase here when he started getting involved with, uh, let me hit the lights really quick. When Paul started really mastering his understanding, you know, he, he already knew color before, but now he's really incorporating it into his work. And so this is from Tangle. Look at the power of that scene right there. Do you guys remember what that is? Yeah. In Tangled, that's when Tangled discovers what part of her original history is and part of her background and everything and her dad and all that. I mean, and so he's getting to this point where now he's using color, but do you still see the organic flows? Yeah. I remember him talking about, you know, learning a ton from drawing from nature because then he could take these curves and organic shapes and incorporate it into everything. So he tries to incorporate it into his, his storyboards. Even if it's like a bunch of troops, how would you incorporate that with a bunch of troops marching? They have a banner that they're holding, and the banner might wave and create an organic. You might put three or four guys together with swords. You might have a, a curve or, or an organic, and so on. He's just always thinking about ways, you know, overlapping shapes, drawing other shapes on top of each other. And I think this is, you know, for some of you that are interested, I mean, this is the, the pivotal mark of storytelling where you are, have the ability to understand perspective, you can draw anything you want, you can draw environments, you can draw characters in it, then you understand tone, and then you can produce it in color. And when you get to that point, pretty much, if you're at this level, the world is your oyster, meaning that you will work for numerous entertainment companies, because people are going to request you. Uh, you know what, let me just turn that off. It's actually, it, it kills some more work. It's easier to see like this. Then I'll turn it back. It's just beautiful, beautiful stuff. So um, it's important for me to show you this because even in a staging piece, look at how many organics are in there, you know? Look at how that tree is attached to the ground. Look at how this windy little supporting element comes over and look at how there's a highlight right on it, right above her face. And then she's got the knife there and then there's this, you know, raven up there. And it's just, it's such a well put together scene. You know, that's what a lot of good storytelling is about. And I was... Last night, talking to my, to my environment design class, telling them one of your goals as an artist is, because this is what the, the European masters did, it's what the American illustrators did. One of your jobs is to find somebody's work that you really respect and then emulate it. You trace it, you copy it, you look at how they stage things. You want to do that because then you start learning their little secrets, their little trades on how they're working, and then you apply that into your work. Okay? So, um, Let's see, let's go through some other stuff here. Some great little um, tree studies there. That was for, um, I didn't let's see, I didn't like that movie as much. What was the movie they did that was like in the Mayan? Oh, Emperor's New Groove. Thank you. But that was, like thank you. So this was all like tree design stuff for Emperor's New Groove. So if some of you were drawing trees, I'd like you at a minimum to start off with a page of just natural environments, trees, and plants. But if you want to try something stylized like this, I can grab some more of this information and put it on the blog for you, and you can use it for reference to look at, okay? Because it is. It's cool to look at that. Look at how much fun that tree is. In fact, here, talking about organics, have you seen some of the beautiful trees we have on the California coastline? They, they sort of root out, and they attach, and we have these really cold mornings in California, which are useless information here, but that's why we make some of the best Pinot Grigio wine is because that particular grape needs really, really cold air. And that's why we have these big, beautiful plants on the coast is in the morning, all this cold air comes in 
and that air turns into condensation and it waters the plants. And then we get this bright sunlight that comes in during the day. So we get these really beautiful curved trees and like big forestry mm -hmm. elements. Once you go up to like Santa Barbara County and start going north, the everything along the, the 101 up there and along the freeway is just absolutely wonderful. Just beautiful uh, vegetation and growth, you know, in that part of California. So um, anyway, looking at work here, you know, even looking at this, there's two guys fighting here. Look at the organics in there. Look at the curves in there, you know. So there's really a lot to learn when you're looking at, at nature and you're getting a good feel for how things come together. And these are some of the notes that I gave you guys. He talks about basics right here. Trees and vegetation, okay. And um, when I took this course from Paul, I didn't know any of this stuff. I, no one had ever talked to me about trees and vegetation. No one told me that they existed in shapes. No one told me that trees adhered to a ground plane and that you had flowing ground planes and they would rise up above and it would allow you to see something that's really, really, you know, cool and put together. No one had ever talked about stuff like this. So it wasn't until I got in the business and started working and then I got to work under this guy named Michael Spooner and Michael really was really big with this too and he had actually knew Paul and they had worked together. So... Um, there's that part where you're working with another artist and you're inspiring each other as a group or a team, you know, developing things, okay? Um, and then there's some other stuff here. What's funny is I had to redraw that when I worked on a Winnie the Pooh movie. I had to redraw and add a whole other section to it. Um, let me see what else Paul has up here. Some other organic stuff. Look at that. Look at how cool that image is. So, by the way, this medium that he's using here is Prismacolor paper, uh, excuse me, Prismacolor pencil on like a tracing paper or a vellum, okay? Um, sometimes he also switched and there's a, a strap more glossy paper. Is that a phone or what is that noise? Oh, it's coming from there, okay. Um, <laughs> he had like a strap more glossy paper and he would use graphite on that. And the paper was like a, it was, it was very smooth. So the graphite would just like move around. It was really easy to erase. And you could smudge on that and then pull up highlights like this. It's actually a really fantastic technique for drawing. I actually thought about covering part of that and, and showing you guys. But do you see, I just wanted to show you Paul's stuff because when I think of somebody who draws organics, well, I always think about Paul. Everything that he does from plants and trees down to, you know, buildings. See, everything has an organic flow. Everything has curves in it. So even if it doesn't have trees and bushes and mountains and rocks on it, he's figuring out another way to incorporate um, other elements into it. Let me see if I can find he had a couple other really cool sketches. I hate to just bypass his work so quick, but I also want to stop and start drawing for you guys really fast. Um, these are beautiful here. These are some of his little studies. These are all thumbnails right here that he would do for Tarzan. Um, they're literally like this big, like I mentioned before. They're like four by six. And he would just go in there and create these beautiful comps. And so um, when he, I remember I, I was taking this class when he was working on this show in the mid-90s. And there's a lot to learn about the way he would stage. So let me point something out to you from a staging point because you guys are going to be creating a horizon line throwing a grid plane in there, and then you're going to start drawing or multiple organics. First, we're going to do one base page. It's just going to be simple organic plants, just at random, on no perspective. And then the second page um, will be groupings of plants together. And then the third page will be have a horizon line in the middle. It'll have some type of a flowing plane. And then I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about foreground, midground, and background, and about placing elements on different levels. So you will start literally, and if you wanted to, you can even use three colored pencils if you want to, or you can use the same, it's up to you. But a lot of what's happening here is there are elements in the midground, there are elements here in the foreground, and there are elements in the background. And that is one of the secrets to how you draw organics and make them look realistic, is you have to think about placements of shape and how they overlap each other and what's being communicated on a three-dimensional grid plane. Okay, well, it's just great stuff to look at, right? Okay, and um, somebody else, I hate to show you this guy, but um, 
He's more stylized. And his name is Ivan Durrell. And um, he was one of the designers on Snow White. Okay. Mm -hmm. He was also an American fine art or California fine artist that produced these really beautiful images that had a lot to do with organics. See that? Mm -hmm. So he would really stylize stuff. So Ivan Durrell's stylization came in. And this is way, way before Paul. This is like Snow White days, right? So he was doing this stuff in the 50s, and he was coming up with these really fantastic ideas for plants. And he loved going up in, like, central California. It's funny because uh, sometimes I go up and go camping by Pismo Beach area, Oceana Dunes. And when you're driving up there, there's like it's like two hours north of, uh, of Santa Barbara. And what's great about Pismo is whenever it's 100 degrees down here, it's right on the ocean. It's always 74 in Pismo because the ocean breeze comes in on, on the side. And when you're driving up there, there's these beautiful flowing mountains in the central of California. He used to go up here all the time, and he would draw and just create all these beautiful images of the mountains with, you know, cattle and sheep on it and, and them grazing. And he just had a really cool stylistic way of working. I mean, you look at this stuff, and you're just like, Whoa, look at how beautiful that is. You know what I mean? It's just really, really stunning. And he had a way of looking at shapes and finding out how to simplify them. Okay? So I'll also put up a couple other samples of some Ivan Durrell for you. Because even if you don't draw any of these, it's important that you look at work that he did for Disney or other book, children's books and stuff. And you realize... Number one, it's a new artist some of you never knew, right? And then you see the importance of how this particular individual, look at how he treated organics. Look at the flowing curves inside there, okay? So that's a compilation of a bunch of stuff. But, um, man, just the way that he tackled and did things, he did so many of these pieces. A couple years ago, I found one of his prints for sale. It was like $5,500, wow. and I was so tempted to go get it. It was printed and signed by him. I'm like, man, that'd be so awesome, but it's sort of hard to just shell out $5,500 when your kids need braces, right? You know, <laughs> Like, you can have crooked teeth, and let me have my Ivan Earl piece hanging in the house, right? Oh, have you, um, I forgot his name, but he did and Bambi. Oh, yeah, the he Bambi. He did um, all the Bambi background. It's like um, Chinese style. I don't know who that is. That's a good um, one. I wonder if, if Ivan Earl didn't have something to do with it because he was, you know, one of the key designers and did a lot of, that's a beautiful piece right there. It's a little small, but he just did so much. And he, he and you could see the style transferring into, into this. You see the trees? And you see the way he's making the forest and the blocky shapes? This was the importance of it. And this is why people in animation loved him, is he could create really cool, simple shapes. He can simplify it, but he still had enough detail to make it make sense. So what I'll do is when I finish this demo today and after I go through the sketchbooks, to me it's cool for you guys to see this because this is style. This is when you're merging drawing with a little bit of design and then you get the recipe as style at the end, right? So it's cool for you guys to look at this because yeah, you could, you could do a really cool looking, here's a picture of him working, right? You could create a really fantastic scene like that. You know, you could draw a tree like that or like this one. You know, you just need to think about how you're piecing your whole entire world together and how what kind of structure is happening inside it. You know, and of course, you can also go to Pinterest and then just create an Ivan Durrell folder from all the different work and people already have stuff saved, which is absolutely wonderful that you guys have access to that type of uh, imagery. Okay. Anyway. So enough of that. Let's come back over here. And um, so when you go to our class blog, if you click on here, I've already uploaded for you the images from Paul Felix. So you could grab and drag these and save them. And this is what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit with you because I sat in the room when I was a student when Paul drew these for us. And he was sitting there sketching. And right off the top, what do you, what's this in the background here, folks? Rising. That's right. And what's that? In there. It's ellipse. So he's considering the elliptical circle of the tree 
and the change in the ellipse as what? As the tree rises above the horizon line. So we're sort of back to square one with the other information I've already been teaching you, right? Is that your worlds were predicated around a horizon line and, they're, and the contour lines of those particular trees and elements or whatever it is you want to draw all coexist with each other because it depends on the horizon line and how we're looking at a particular object. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about those today. And then we already saw that right there. We're just talking about uh, foliage and, and problems. Um, and here's a great thing you've been in here, mentioned in here. It's easy to forget plants appear in perspective, like everything else, for example. Many plant forms in nature are highly irregular and complex, and a natural temptation is to give up and copy what is seen in life. Typically, this results in vegetation that looks pasted on and overly attentive, grabbing out of step with the rest of the drawing. And that's what happens is that's your natural tendency as an artist. When something you don't know, you copy the outline. So you look at the outline and you draw the outline, but you're not building from the inside structure. And that's a difference what I'm going to talk about today with you is I'm going to talk about a gesture line, building the structure, then coming in and adding the other stuff on top of it. It'll make it feel more realistic, okay? It's important to remember that everything, including plants, must go through an editing process before being drawn. You are abstracting the natural world and putting it on paper, those symbols that express the feeling of real objects. Remember, too, your grid patterns and how trees and shrubs sit on the land. You can use them to provide clues about the, what? Ground plane, which is our grid plane we've already been talking about. It's one of the biggest secrets of drawing, but yet I'll be in a class and I've covered it 20 times with students and they still forego the ground plane. The ground plane is key in really establishing depth and making things work. Okay, cool. Um, that came out a little bit smaller, but there's some other stuff about tone. That's one of the other sketches we looked at already. Okay, that's some stuff from Lilo. All right, and somebody else, while we're on the topic, you know, let me just go through there. Um, yeah, so there's our, I put some other organic samples up there for you to look at from some other artists to give you an idea of what people have to paint and draw and design. So this is a common thing having to think of and design different trees. So here's the difference for some of you because you guys are all at different drawing levels, right? On your first and second page when you're drawing trees, maybe your first page is just all variation plants, right? On your second page, if you want to start designing a little bit and putting a flare on something, go for it. If you don't feel you're there yet, then don't do that. Do you see the stylistic feel to these? Do you see the twists happening in the, inside the structure? That's where we get to a level of design. That's fun when we get to do stuff like that, okay? I don't want to force you to do that. Some of you aren't at that level, but if you are, it allows you to start thinking about how to bring the structure together. And here's one thing that's really cool too, is in, imagine in storytelling, emphasizing parts of nature to indicate what the emotional impact is of the scene. So if you have a, a horror, horror scene or an evil scene that's gonna happen, you need to think about incorporating plants that give off that feel, right? These plants are not warm and fuzzy right here, are they? They have spikes on them, they feel dangerous, Look at this thing. That, I don't know who wrote what the script is for that, but that feels like little pollen sacks of poison right there, and there's spikes all around it. In fact, nature has a way of telling you with certain plants, you know, what to stay away from, right? Just something to think about, right? And then, yeah, there's this one here. Now, look at the difference between that, excuse me, some of these here, and what's on here. Look at how friendly and round those are. Notice the Ivandurl influence on that tree. See it there? Pretty important, right? And look at these. Look at how beautiful those are. So, would it be a good idea in a portfolio if you took a bunch of the plants that you drew and then you happen to have a digital painting class and you went in there and started painting them? Absolutely. That'd be a great idea. That right there is a portfolio page. There are, there are positions in studios for people to do stuff like this where they have to paint all the organics and all the other elements that are uh, relative to a particular show. Okay, cool. And then there's some other sketches there. All right, enough said there. Um, so 
Uh, you know what? While we're on the topic, let me show you my buddy and my uh, teacher, Michael Spooner. Uh, Michael's someone I took some classes from, and then eventually I got to work under Michael. And he was my boss for about uh, three and a half years at Big Idea. And Michael's an amazing artist. He's super talented. I want you to take a look at some of his organics because you get a really good feel at how he tells stories with organic shapes, too. And by the way, him and Paul did work together. Okay? Disney for years. They worked in Disney television where they had to produce, on average, two to three drawings like this a day. And they could do it. And they would knock them out. That was about average to 12 to 15 a week. That's a great um, style using these pencils, which are Prismacolor pencils, and either black or indigo blue on tracing paper. It's very efficient and it's very forgiving. Okay, so when we go through some of this, let me get, let me skip to a couple of the organics that he has. It's one of my favorite pieces right there. Yeah, it's looking down in the cemetery, and this is for Lilo and Stitch seeing the gravestones, tombstones, and then having all these organics in here and the way you treated the organics back in here, the way you treated the organics in the back here, some of them behind the house. Okay, really quite fantastic. Here's another great piece. Isn't that pretty cool? Okay, lots of organics in there. In fact, 90% of that whole piece is organics. It's just the house that's there. That's it. Everything is the road, you know, with all these trees and forest around it, you know? So, um, Michael's just one of these super duper talented guys too. They can sketch really fast and draw great, okay? All right, so that's Michael's stuff. This is a site called TurboSquid. TurboSquid sells models that, th that people make in the 3D world. And I love this site for reference because anything I want in reference is on here. So if I were to come in here and type in palm trees there is somebody out there that is buying and selling palm trees in 3d see that and guess what there's no copyright on any of this so that means when you're drawing i always have students go i couldn't find palm trees i couldn't find plants go to turbo squid it is a great i'll put this on the blog for you i'll put a link there for you mm -hmm. it's a great reference there is absolutely fantastic wonderful samples of models up here all different types of plants and what's really cool a little hidden secret there's no copyright and they're usually rendered on white background so that means i could take that image right there in photoshop and i could turn that into a brush and then when i'm painting an environment i just stamp it once and i have that tree down as a brush it's it's freebie i hate to mention that because then one day they're going to start putting like copyrights and even if they did put copyright on it there's this gray area in copyright law that if you take something and change it 60% and it's not recognizable, you can use it. Yeah. So there's this weird grayness there. So if I take that, turn it black and white, using it as a value stamp, as a brush, painting on top of it, I've changed more than 60% of it. So what's really cool is you can find close-ups in here. You can look at the shapes. There's lots of great information on the site. Okay, And you can find house plants. Just everything you could possibly think of, you can find these type of leafy plants. So if you wanted to, you could literally just go through here and start looking at a bunch of organics. And you can even be specific on the site. You could say vines. Look, and there's a whole thing on vines. Look mm -hmm. at that. It's actually, a, I have that as a brush. There's a whole thing over here on clumps of vines. All kinds of stuff, you know. So anything, you can even, let's see if we type in rocks with trees boom look at that so you could draw organic rocks and have trees all over it right it's all relative it's all in the same family okay all right with that said and done i'll link that up let me turn the lights back on watch your eyes One time, ready, go. Okay. Um, 
Let me stop the recorder real quick, and then I'm going to get the, the drawing set up. Okay, so your first page of organics are just going to be various organics, okay? And I want to give you a couple of tips that might help you out in understanding how to draw them, okay? Um, in nature with organics, everything tends to radiate to a center. Does that make sense? So when you're looking at, for example, if I have a, a bunch of leaves, I have a center, and if I have a leaf that's going to come out, and I, you can think of this almost as a line of action, where I literally have a leaf that's going to come out, and then it's going to come from that center point. Does that make sense? So even when you look at palm trees, you have a palm tree that's coming up, and then from that palm tree over here is sort of the center, and then you have these big leaves that are going to be coming outside of part of that shape. Okay? So that's really helpful for me because this line represents sort of what we call like a line of action. So if I can come in here and sketch a line of action, that becomes what I call like a center line, right? So it allows me to come in here and then add a side to my line. And by looking at that line, I see where the center is now. You see that? Oh, give me a second to recalibrate. Okay, sorry about that. I just need to calibrate really quick because I noticed my line here was getting massively was off. Okay, now go to eraser. There it goes. Yeah, it's working. So that line of action, what I can do is I can wrap that and I can see, let me draw it in red so it's a little bit easier. I can sort of see that line of action as it comes through like this. And then when I switch over to blue, it allows me to then figure out dot, 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 how I'm sort of drawing through and drawing that plant together to see how I have a leaf there, right? That's a really great way to think about how you're drawing is number one, you're starting from the center, okay? Number two, you have this line of action and you just come up here and you can decide if, you know, by overlapping the line, this leaf's gonna come a little closer towards me, right? And then maybe I have another leaf that's going this way and then it's gonna drop behind itself and end like that. So. I can come back onto this and then go, hey, that's my center line. My leaf tip is going to come up to about here. And my leaf hits up about right there. It's going to start to roll over. And then when that rolls over, that's going to come back down to about here. And it's going to thin itself down as that comes back here, dot, 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 connect to that other edge. And then I have another leaf. So part of organics. Step number one here, let me just write this down so you don't forget it. We talked about starting with the center. Number two, we have a uh, line of action, okay? And then step number three is we have a grouping of multiple elements, okay? So to make this feel like a real plant, I have to keep coming in here and looking at that line and figuring out how to put geometry on top of that line. Something else that can help too is if you put a couple lines going across like this, it allows you to sort of see how that tree geometry is folding in front of you. Does that make sense? Okay, so then if I come over here, look, I have another center line, but this time my tree uh, leaf shape is coming here and sort of going back down. Then it's going to fold over and here's the back of it, there's the tip. So that tip's gonna come like this, wrap up to here, it's gonna come up here, and I'm gonna draw my dotted lines so I can see through what that leaf is doing. Does that make sense? We always draw the dotted lines because we're drawing through the shape. So then I can come back over to here, let me pronounce. If you decide to come in and you add a little details, you know, that you might see where part of the leaf split up a little bit, maybe there's a little chunk out of the leaf because of the bugs it's going to make it look a little bit more realistic, okay? Now, this one is just sort of an open curve going to the side, so I might decide in this piece I have maybe a light horizon line about there, so I'm just barely seeing the turn of that leaf shape coming into here, and then that's going to come down to like a center. Part of this is going to come this way, and then it's going to sort of skim over the top a little like that. And maybe when it wraps over, dot, 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 I see a little bit of the inside right in there of that, okay? So that's the first thing I do when I start to draw certain plant shapes is I just think about this gesture line, and then I come back in, 
and then I find the tip, I find where that point is, and then I come in and I start drawing my lines, figuring out how these elements hook up to each other. And it actually works pretty nice because then you get this feel of everything being correct and it feels like the shapes are actually working. So that might be one plant structure for me right there. Um, actually, let's add a couple more things to that. I was going to just stop on it, but sometimes I like to put a little bit more detail in there. I like I want to do overlap. I'll mention that down here. Overlap is great. It's part of grouping when we have one element in front of another element. So this leaf that's here in the back, it's receding away from the center, right? So you have to think of this. Let me draw these little arrows. This leaf is going like this, and it's going in that direction, going away from me, right? Versus the other leaf was coming up and then is flipping and coming into this direction. Does that make sense? So as this one's flipping behind, if we look at it from a three-dimensional space of the circle, this one, dot, 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 is going behind me versus this one, dot, 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 is coming and landing in front of me. Does that make sense? A little bit. That's an easier way to think about it because you're thinking about how the leaves are falling. So in this scenario, I was imagining the leaf would sort of come up to about here and then start to fold over. And then I'm going to drop it and then I'm going to have an overlap where it drops back down. I'm going to get that center line back in for that leaf. And then I'm going to draw the back side of that leaf coming in like this. Okay. And that really helps create a realistic feel, you know, and by the way, I'm just doing this out of my head. I'm not looking at reference. So if you guys look at reference, look at how you have that center approach. Look at how there's a line of action. Look at the grouping. So what I mean by grouping is putting two or three elements together that become grouped. Okay. So like in here, I might have a smaller leaf just coming out. Maybe it's like a baby leaf that's starting to grow. So this smaller leaf becomes grouped with this bigger leaf. Does that make sense? Okay. And actually, that's one little trick that I've always done is when you go back into the center stem to that center point, the leaves get smaller. Does that make sense? Because they're usually starting out. Now, some trees, the new leaves come from the inside of the middle. Does that make sense? So some palm trees, I've noticed, the inside... The outside is the big fat leaves, like this, that are coming out, okay? And But then in the inside, you have the smaller leaves sort of coming in like that. Does that make sense? So that's something to think about depending on the, on the, the plant or the structure. There might be a difference there. And I've noticed it opposite to on some flowers. On the inside, the smaller leaves are coming out and blooming, and they grow from part of the inside, okay? So... Anytime I'm doing this, I'm always starting with that center line and I'm coming over and I'm adding thicknesses to it to make it feel like it is a realistic looking leaf. Okay, let me erase some of this. So what I'm going to do is just keep drawing some more organics here and encourage you to just look at some reference to have fun and draw. Now, if you want to try doing something that has like a, let's say you want to do this cool idea where you have like a rock, some kind, and maybe this rock is, has another, maybe that rock sitting on top of this other like jagged little rock guy here, like that, and there's another rock there, right? Oops, hit my keyboard. If you decide you want to come in here and try adding something that looks like it's flowing and it has vines, okay? And then you have these little vines and little leaves and they're going across part of the shape and then maybe there's this like round area and there's like little organic elements around and then the vines are still breaking apart and they're separating and then they're wrapping part of the shape and going down and coming around and they have these little flowers that sort of grow around, right? And then Maybe we're part of this, this growing right here. There's like a center, a bulbous mass. And then from there, you have this wonderful 
plant that's growing out, and then you have a leaf structure coming off of that. There's no reason why you can't go in and do a little grouping like that. You know, I encourage you to use some of your imagination creativity, but don't like draw a car that's like super detailed and then you're gonna go in and put a bunch of leaves on it, right? You just come in here. I'm just right now, what I'm really doing, you see me throwing my pencil line around? I'm just getting those organics in there. I just come in here and just go, try to get that smooth feel of nature coming up and boom, there's like a leaf there. And then right here, boom, there's in one here, boom. There's one coming down in front of me and there's one maybe falling back behind that one. And then I just come in, I draw off those center lines and I try to add in the rest of the leaf shapes. So that one might be in the front. This one coming behind it. Sort of wrapping around and then that comes down. There might be a little bit of a tip from the center there. Okay, and then this one might come up and get really broad and have a little bit of a bend in it. And then that center comes back down to like here. Okay. I want to move that center line over a little bit more, so I'll throw it in about there. So and also I forgot to mention this. Do you know why that center line is so important? Too? It's the main vein of the leaf. It's the artery. It's the artery that goes right down the middle of the leaf. Every single broad leaf has it. So you're actually drawing, it's almost like drawing, you know when you draw the human figure, draw the skeletal system in it, and you get the bones in there first, and then you add the anatomy on top, because it makes sense that way. It's almost the same thing that I'm doing here, is I'm thinking about how these little elements work together, right? And I know I can squeeze another little leaf right in here. Center line. back to the brush. There it goes. There. Another little leaf in there. Okay. And then I was working on those vines, right? So maybe part of the vines come over here and they go this way. I've always noticed with vines, they have like a little, like they come out and then they have like a knuckle. You know what I mean? Like one area is a little thinner. And they have this knuckle that sort of wraps around and then the rest of the vine spreads out in a branching system. And by the way, branching systems, God, I wish I knew that video. Marshall had this great video one day that talked about branching systems of nature because your body is a branching system. You have your core is your brain, right? And from here, you go down and then you have, you think about it, every part of your body, every bone goes to one major bone. So right here you have one major bone, right? And then you go into you go in the radius and the ulna, which are two bones, which then goes into five bones in the wrist, which then goes into about, you know, I don't know exactly I forget how many, and then it goes into multiple bones out. So everything starts from one core and goes wider, wider, wider as it goes out. That same branching system is happening inside nature as well. Okay. Um, so real quick, what I want to mention, those are leafy plants. That's my solution for leafy plants. Center line, line of action, grouping and overlap, right? What happens now when you're dealing with a bush? Or you're dealing with something that's not really leafy, but it's in a bulbous mass, okay? So what I like to do is I start with this. And then I come over here and I find where that center line is. And then I wrap a couple lines around that shape, okay? And then from there, what helps me is it, remember, all bushes have a structure. Maybe part of this goes into the ground, like so. And then maybe over here, there's another bulbous shape right in here. And then maybe part of this branch system that goes over here, maybe there's a smaller one in here. So this is some type of a bush that's growing, right? So I like to think about these as having center lines and wrapping lines around them because that is sort of how I learned it from Paul. 
and how it enables me to think. So then, since this is a bulbous mass, I then can come on and then add on these details of what the bush looks like and how part of that bush might actually connect, maybe a little bit connects to here. And then when I have interior lines, I treat them really in relativity to where the light's coming from. So if a light's coming this way from left to right, I might come back in here and do this because that makes it look like a little bit more of where the shadow area would be. I put those little interior lines. And then, you know, some little plants have little flowers and they have little other little round elements in there. Maybe I see part of that, that structure that's coming off of there and then I have this other sort of bulbous shape that's going to be in here. All right? But again, I'm looking at it and saying, hey, my contour line should be wrapping this way. Because that's how that shape comes together. Darken up some of those little branches. Maybe the, the base comes down into here. And then it sort of breaks off a little bit and you have a little bit of a root structure, right? And then I have this one. It's sort of pointing upward a little bit. Maybe there's a little, I don't know, maybe a little thing, a leaf or whatever. Even when I put these little lines like this, they act as contour lines to indicate what's happening to part of that shape. Does that make sense? And the fact that this one's overlapping this one, and then they're all sort of connected in design, what I'm trying to do is stipulate, hey, that is a grouping right there. So even if we have a bulbous bush, it's still grouped together, okay? All right, um, let me come over here. And then I think what I'm gonna do is one more demo for you really quick that deals with a tree. And then I'm gonna stop and then I'll record and I'll just fill my page here. What I like to do is I like to put a little bit of tone under my drawings so I can pop out and see part of the silhouette because it tells me how well the drawing's working, okay? Um, and here's a secret to trees. So I know some of you are dying to try a tree. Part of the secret is what Paul had already drawn in here. Oh, that's not Paul. That's not Paul. Let's go back to our... So part of the secret's right here. It's that horizon line. And it's understanding where the tree connects to the ground. You see how he drew a square? Oops. So I drew that square in there. And then he has that ellipse. That's golden right there. Okay? So, and then again, look at the masses. Do you see the lines in there that I was just drawing on my bush? He's doing the same thing in his trees, but then eventually you start to lose those lines because you're using other contour line to dictate the change in the surface. Right? Okay? So I'm going to come back over here. Oops, come on, escape out of there. And what I'm going to do really lightly here is I'm just going to put, not in red, in a blue, I'm going to put a really light line like that. It just indicates what my horizon line is, okay? So whenever I draw a tree, the first thing that I do is I come in here and I start like this. Boom. I throw my ellipse down. Because once my ellipse is down, I then understand how I can make my tree come in and curve and the direction part of my tree might be flowing it. Once I anchor my tree to the ground, and now I, I feel it anchored, right? I have a horizon line. I can tell it's there. And what's really helpful for me, and you guys should try this, is if you come in here, one of your assignments is going to be to draw. Um, I'll do another demo for you on that when I come back next week. One of your assignments... Part one of this is just going to be to draw the, a bunch of plants randomly. Then I want you to draw a grid plane. Okay? And then go in and fill it with plants and think about foreground, background, and background. So what's important for me is that I have this little grid here. Does anyone know why that's important? Because if I go to the center of that, which I mentioned center a couple minutes ago, right? It allows me to see how the roots come out and cast because it's spreading from the middle. So if I come over here and I draw a little line on the side of the tree right there, I can then come over here 
and I go from this line and go like that. And when I just did that, it allows me to take the top of the tree and come down like this. Now roots and base elements start from one point and then they spread out. So then when I get maybe to about here, what I call like the knuckle of the tree, where that little bend is, I then come over here and I go, and I bring another one out. And then when I hit that next little knuckle, that one changes into one like this. And then that goes and then that one spreads into one. That one spreads into one, makes sense? That's how a part of my root is gonna take place. Now here's a little golden secret. Most trees when they're built or drawn and anchored down and you get that root coming in here, right? Most trees, the root is the exact same distance as the canopy above. It's its own mathematical support system. So the root will come down in here and go like this. That makes sense? So if I wanted to, I could technically think of that ellipse on the top and draw it down here. And then that's the pattern that my root is going to exist in. That makes sense? Pretty easy, right? And it looks right, doesn't it? So even in that little sketch, I could come up here and then I could put a branch here going up and then I could come put some of my foliage top of that tree and I might have another branch that comes out here. Let me erase my little side dots there. Okay, and that's what I was gonna do here, but I wanted to just talk about that for you, about how that anchors to the grid and I wanted to draw it large. Obviously, if I try to draw that tree and the whole tree, I'm gonna run out of space. So that's why I'm gonna just draw it small over here. But what was important, what I, I didn't mean to jump ship here, what I was talking about here was thinking about that I have a root, it's gonna come from this line, that shape, and it's gonna come out like this, and then it's gonna bend and come over here, and then it's gonna break into twos and split into other groups. Like that. And then over, even on the back side, so where I drew those dotted line, right there, that is gonna be a root back here, it's gonna come out, and part of that's gonna go down. And it's gonna split into the ground as well. Like that. And that's when you're looking at trees, once you start spending some time drawing from nature and looking at trees, you'll start to notice how everything is spreading out from that center point, right? The other thing that's really cool with trees is trees are like muscles sometimes. When you get into this part in here that's bending, there's almost like a little bit of a line there where this feels like a bicep. So something you can do with trees to really get this mass to make it feel like it's sort of rounding in here like this, that contour line, is we can come in here and put some little lines and really make it feel like there's these little muscle structures that come off of the tree. So as we break into a branch here and a branch that goes this way, we hit like a little elbow. So watch, I'm gonna basically draw a forearm. It's like there's a bend, that's the forearm. There's the wrist, you see it sort of? Mm -hmm. And then where that bends in, I put a little bicep in there. Mm -hmm. And it comes to like a shoulder. And then this connects back down in part of the tree and goes back down like so. Okay, so then I come back over here. Let's say this one, I'm gonna foreshorten it a little bit. It comes up here to this sort of middle point. And then I'm gonna have it go down behind itself. And then I'm gonna have it come over here. I'm gonna have it split into twos. That's going to split. Oops. And then there might be another branch that goes back this way. It splits that way, going up into the upper canopy. So then when I go to draw the canopy, I, I'm above my horizon line, right? So back over here to this little study I was doing. Okay. So I might have a canopy shape that's right here that has little branches under it like this. And that's that canopy overlapping this other shape. You see it? And then I might decide to come in here and go, oh, what if I had a branch that comes off the middle here and goes, and then right over here, I'm going to overlap that shape. OK? 
as Phil mentioned, right up here, center, starting from the center, line of action, grouping, and overlap. So if I come over here and now I overlay, overlay, overlap, I can't talk. Sometimes I talk in the lecture and it starts to... I'm still indicating that this right here is the underneath part by putting that little line in there, right? And then I can come back over here, put some little details on there, maybe where part of that breaks off. Maybe that's getting a little bit thinner. Maybe that breaks into part of the tree. Sometimes I look back at my trees and I go, hey, that's cool, but I, it needs to even be thicker. So then I come over and I just go, okay, add a little bit more part of that tree. But I'm thinking about my tree as a mass, a cylinder shape. And I'm always thinking about light coming down in one direction. So I'm hitting other sides and putting little bits of detail to make the spheres look like they're correct and realistic. So does that look, does that tree look proper right here? Right? That's out of my brain. That's out of my memory just from drawing trees and going and sitting and sketching. That's one of the reasons why I want to encourage you guys to be doing part of the same thing. And then I always have one student that comes in and draws the dead tree with like no leaves on it like a tree in the middle of winter. You can do that. It's a little harder because you have all the branch systems, but if you really want to learn a little bit more, focus on part of those branch systems and try to figure out how all of this, these elements come together. So what I'm going to do, oops, what did I just do? Did I move? I meant to take, hold on, let's go back. I'm going to take this part of my drawing because there's no way I can fit the whole tree in there. And I'm going to scale it down a little bit smaller, bring it back in the corner, and then I'll fill in a little bit more of the tree there. Okay? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and keep drawing while you guys are working after I go through your sketchbooks real quick. Sorry. But that's sort of where I'm at right now, and that's just drawing from, you know, imagination, pulling it out together, right? So go back into this. I want you guys to have fun with this. Your first page, so I'll put this up on the blog, reminder. First page is just random trees, plants, whatever you want, just organic shapes. Your second page... I'd like you to start like doing one and overlapping another and creating some groupings. So you want to, usually groupings work better in primes, like threes and fives. So maybe three plants overlapping, maybe five plants overlapping each other. Then I'd like you to go back on your last page, put a horizon line in there in a grid plane, and then start building up from there. I do have another demo that I did on that from another semester. I'd like to do another demo for you, but... Um, I want to give you time to draw, and I won't be able to do that demo till Wednesday. So my thought is on this is that you guys get all next week to work on this, and then by Monday, I want you to try to wrap up the organic so we can move to... Uh, I'm probably going to move to talking a little bit about tone, and then I want us to get some markers and take some colored paper and sketchbooks, and then that week we'll keep working in organics but using some markers and tone and white prisma colors, and I'll show you some techniques to draw them really quick, and then we'll go out and plan a field trip, um, and we'll start going over to draw the Arboretum for a little bit. Sound cool? Okay. All right, you're free to drive. Uh, free to drive. That's what happens when I lecture all day. I get all, you're free to draw. Let me go through your stuff. I'll pause this real quick, and I'll be right back. Okay, so um, I know we were, this demo went a little bit late um, because the class ended, and then I wasn't here on Monday. Um, so I decided to touch back on a couple things. This, what I did right here, is actually what we're gonna talk about today. That's actually a grouping right there because we, I have rocks in there with some, with some plants and with some vines, okay, with one main plant. But um, I wanted to touch on that really quick and just mention something. Rocks are part of nature and are a organic. Now it's not foliage, which we know, but Rocks are very, very important to a lot of drawing, especially when we get into like storyboarding and staging and environment design, because there's all different types of rocks that really have different types of, of feels and design to them that can actually identify even to parts of the world that you might be at, you know, a specific sites. Like if you look at Utah, or if you look at um, Bryce Park or Bryce Canyon, you look at, you know, um, uh, Zion, okay, a couple different locations. Even when I had a chance when I was younger to do some backpacking and when I was in parts of Europe and I went to a couple part, a couple countries 
in North Africa. The rocks and some of the formations are really fantastic. So I just wanted to mention that because as you're sketching, that's something that you could think about because one of our next trips coming up is going to be, like I said, we're going to do a couple field trips and try to get some sketching in down um, uh, the street here at the Fullerton Arboretum, okay, which has great plant life. If you walk around the Arboretum, it actually feels like you're on a, on the Universal lot for like a film and you're, you know, they're building some type of really funky environment for like a King Kong movie. That's how beautiful part of their, their background is there. So anyway, um, I think what I'll do right now is let me go over here and just, I wanted to talk a little bit about overlap, okay? Um, and, and discuss when I'm sketching and drawing, how do I think about overlap and how does it tie in? So digitally, it's a little bit easier because I have layers and I can do a cheat, right? So I can draw one thing, overlap a rock or two and put another plant in front of that and it's gonna work a little bit, a little bit better. Um, and the other thing, before I start to dive into um, doing any form of overlap, it's going to be really important that you guys take a look at some of the reference that I already put up for you. And when we talked about different types of leaves and different types of trees and plants and, you know, getting into stylization and seeing how things come out of there, for me, what I like to do, if I'm going to do a grouping of plants, I go ahead and I think about what are those three plants I'm going to put in there. So for this example, I'm going to do something with some rocks. I'm going to do a leafy palm like this. And then I'm thinking about some type of a small plant like this that has vines and maybe small leaves. Okay. So those are the three things in the back of my mind. So whenever I do a grouping of objects on a sketch, I'm making sure I've already sort of identified that exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to start with don't ask me why for some reason I really like these sort of large rock shapes like this that are sort of flat and rounded because they allow me they sort of anchor to the ground and then you can have other rock shapes that help hold these elements up which I think is pretty cool okay and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about so I'm gonna go back click over here take a look at my reference really quick and and then also as a reminder we also talked about last week turbo squid right so if I come over to Turbo Squid, I click on this. I'm also going to type in Leafy Palm. Is it me or do they just start cooking next door? It's, yeah, it's pretty strong, isn't it? So I'm going to look at a Leafy Palm here. And I think I need to put Leafy Palm Tree to be specific. And let me click on here. This is some good reference, some good variations there. Okay, so it gives me a couple ideas. And then I'm also looking. They also have some of these little short palms too like this so I'm just gonna go ahead so I'm thinking that something might be some type of a base in here like this and then maybe it has a little bit of, cur of a curve to it and then when it gets up to about here I'm gonna have just these huge leaves coming out so again as I'm sketching this I'm gonna do what I talked about in that last demo where I'm starting with that leaf I have that center line to the leaf and what I really like to do is start in the beginning here and finish what is the part of that leaf and how does it come out and overlap? And then I look at that center line going down the leaf and it comes here and this allows me to see if I go dot, 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 sort of this underneath side to the leaf and how that connects back into part of my plant. So whenever I'm drawing, that's really a huge part of sketching for me is really figuring out the center line, how these flat geometric shapes sort of coming together and then at what point does this bend down and come all back to the beginning of a leaf structure? Okay. And what's cool, if I come back and look at my reference too, that I have, oops, not there. That was our artist in residence. Oops, what happened? Pause. And if I look at the reference that I had here, and I look at the other sheet too, let me go back over and type in palm trees get more of a selection here there we go so there's some cool ones yeah that's what I'm sort of looking for so I remember from sketching these plants before look at the cuts in the leaves and that happens sometimes from the weight of the leaf as it's going and growing the the weight starts to bend in the little ends of the leaf can't stay together so they sort of tear apart so that's something I want to make sure. The other thing is looking at this too, it reminded me, see how some of these come to a little bit of a point 
but then some of them also round off a little bit, okay? So when I come back into part of my sketch, you know, I move my reference aside. Let me minimize it so I can bring it back up, okay? Oops. So I can come in here and make sure I'm getting some of that information in here. So I might decide to round the tip of that one a little bit more. And let me go ahead and get like the thought of a leaf coming up, curving a little bit of flow. So I like to just throw in some of the center lines and figure out what is sort of working and not. And something else that I've come to notice from looking at plants and just going out and sketching. Plants at the base, let me draw it like this. If you have a plant that's growing like this, these leaves that are growing have been growing longer, so they tend to round and curve a little bit more like this. And then leaves that are just in the midsection that are starting to come out have a light curl on them, and then some of the leaves that are brand new that are growing don't really have much of a curl on it. Does that make sense? That's important for me, so when I'm sketching down here, I can think about that, and that's just something that you get, that's one of the benefits of drawing from observation, right? When it's one of those things that you pick up from just looking at your drawing. So if I look down here, um, I can just make sure I really get some nice curves in here, because these have been here for a while, and I'm gonna make them actually maybe even a little bit bigger. So maybe part of that comes in here. I see part of that shape. I have a center line coming down like that. And then once I get that in here, I might even curve it a little bit. Now, I'm not adding any of that detail, that detail yet, which would be like, you know, cutting into the, the, the leaves like that. I'm going to save that for when I'm all done. Because if I do too much of that real quick, it might not look right in part of the drawing. My main thing right now is making sure that I have like a dedicated flow and making sure that these feel like planes curving in space. And I'm drawing through all my shapes. And I know when I come around and check some of your guys' sketches, you're going to be missing some of this because you're going to decide to skip the drawing through the shape right there in that curve. Okay? Something I like to do, too, is I just throw a couple lines going across. A lot of plants have these sort of contour lines, these cross contours going across. And that really allows me to see part of that, that detail and that bend in part of the leaf structure, you know? All right, let's see up here. Now, one thing that's a little hard to do with leaves is it's a little bit of a pain to avoid. You're always gonna have some form of a tangency. So tangencies are, if I have a line coming like this on a leaf, and then I have another line that's coming right off of the same leaf, and then they all come together right here. That's tangency one. That's a, a linear tangency where they're all coming to the same line. Another type of tangency is gonna be when you have a leaf that's gonna come down and hang like this, and then you might have another leaf that's right underneath it, and then this leaf touches that edge, and then that creates a tangency right there. Those are bad, because those create, tangencies have a tendency to, to create a feeling of busyness, and, and they don't feel correct in a drawing. So the secret to avoiding tangencies is, you know, it's sort of hard to avoid this tangency, because eventually, all of these leaves are going to come back, right? They're going to sketch right back into a center being because that's how plants grow and they split. So that one's a little hard to do, but what you can do is try to separate the thickness of the leaves a little bit so they feel like there's multiple thicknesses even overlapping and intertwining themselves, almost like a type of a muscle. And then it makes it feel a little bit more realistic that the, um, the plant leaf is coming off. The other thing to do here, the golden rule that I usually use, is once I get that leaf sketched in here, okay, I either end the leaf before the other leaf, so you end your line before, or if that's not going to work, I come over here and I pull that leaf all the way down and do a full overlap like that, okay? And by doing a full overlap like that, it's telling you, well, hey, this leaf here is way, way in the back here, and it's not going to be part of that. So you sort of have two different options. I'll just write up here on the notes because it's going to happen. Tangents, okay? Tangents are not good and they make a drawing feel a little stiff and sort of out to date. So 
I'm trying to think of that as I'm working in here as well. So let me come over here. Let me sketch in this other leaf in here. All right. I know on palm trees, some of them have like this thick, like bark thing that grows like ran, random pattern, patterns down below because it's the way that it like protects itself after these leaves, actually the leaves fall apart and then you get this bark build up on the outside of the palm tree and it acts as a protectant from bugs and spiders and, and other things and other insects, okay? Here, let me get, get this leaf in here. And if you get really stuck, if you don't like the center line approach of what we're sort of doing, you can just come in here and throw a, you know, throw a line down and start throwing grids like this. This cross contour line is really going to help you see and figure out what is happening inside that shape. Okay. Oops. Again, this leaf here ties back in there a little bit and maybe it gets thin. Sometimes they even have this like wave effect on the outside and then the leaf fully like blossoms into a full leaf structure. Now, if I did that, what am I doing right there? What I just talked about, right? I'm hitting a tangency there. So I don't want that tangency to be right there. So I have to think about that because I actually have to go back in and then adjust part of the flow of that leaf early on like this. Now, something that when I was working with uh, Michael Spooner back in the day, he made a comment to me about it's, it's nice in a design and in a drawing that you need to have full overlap on things. So when you put items in the foreground, you can have, so you'll notice like this leaf, this leaf, and this leaf right now, they're not overlapping anything, right? Anything on the tree, but you'll notice this leaf here is overlapping the other leaf, and then this leaf is overlapping on top. So actually, if you look at it, this right here is actually more inviting to you from a drawing standpoint, because there's multiple items overlapping each other. And since I know that, sometimes I like to have areas that might have a little bit of overlap, and then have areas that have a little bit of rest. So I might come in here, and I'm thinking about what if I just threw in, you know, I sort of have these one, two, three that are evenly spaced. So what if I come in here and see if I can't throw another curved um, leaf sort of popping out of here somehow. So what I was thinking is what if I had something come right down in the middle like this, longer leaf, and then maybe it comes up here, starts to wiggle out a little bit, curves, and then maybe wraps itself behind part of this structure like that. Creates a little bit more overlap for me. Yeah, okay. And then I might come in here now and just put some little details like break up a couple of those little leaf ends. Sometimes you have, you know, a nice little gap or a little tear in there makes it look Again, that's from part of the weight of the leaf. Add some little details. So again, this is where I come back and boom, I bring up my reference. I take a look at it and I'm like, yeah, look at that. You can see that happening quite a bit. Look, in this particular tree, you can see the old leaves that break out. They have those really tall verticals that are very protective around it, right? Let me go back for a minute and see what other, some other reference here too. Take a look at some of that. That's really cool too, besides the plant. I mean, the, the base there, but look at those leaves and how, that's a good example too. That's a, some of these are indoor plants. Look at how it, that leaf flops over. So it's almost like there's a center line and then part of the leaf really drops and gets affected by part of the gravity, you know, pulling part of it down. Um, I remember once way back in the day, oh, that's really cool too those big pattern leaves right there. I actually worked on a, a couple different shows where I had to model the parts of the leaves 
in um, 3D. And one of the things we had is we had a ton of palm trees at angles. And when we had the leaves coming out, we had to make sure we showed the leaf being affected by gravity, right? Because gravity is going to pull it a little bit to one side. So I really like that. I think I might do that part of my next one. These big sort of fluffy leaves with vines in there. Anyway, so I get this part done. And then now I think I'm going to come in here. I talked about putting a little bit of a vine sort of wrapping part of this rock. And having another little sort of like leaf structure. So sort of do it rough first and try to get a feel of how part of that vine might work in there. Try to get a little bit of an organic approach and here I think it'd be cool. I'm going to outline like a group right there of leaves that all part of the vines maybe come back here and it's a thicker base to the vine right in here. So I'm just looking at that outline I have, and I'm trying to make sure whatever I'm going to draw is a, is a grouping here is going to fit together in part of that outline shape. And if I go a little bit past it, that's okay. There. So that works pretty good. Different plant, right? Different leaves, short sort of squatty plant with a broad leaf on it and then we talked about here I'm going to overlap so let's do some more overlap here actually was thinking what if that vine came over here as well broke up and then went heavy again and went thicker and then maybe right here I have another grouping so I'm going to go ahead and carve out part of that shape right there you see that right there and then what I'm going to do since I drew that as one grouping I'm going to erase the line that was underneath there. And then I'm going to come in and sort of bring this together. And then I'm going to do the same thing I just did up here. But I'm going to, I drew that a little darker, so I'm going to grab this, this light brush here in the sketchbook, and I'm going to erase a little bit of that outline so I don't see it as much. Okay. And then let me come back over. Oops. And it's a little too much zoomed in. And then right here, let's start looking for a leaf coming off like this. Now, I just threw a corner of a leaf out. I don't know if you see it right here, but it's hitting a tangency. already hitting that other leaf there. So I'm going to delete that guy and I'll add to it a little bit later. Right up in here, I get another leaf coming a little bit towards me. the base there. Hold on back there. Cool. There, so now we have another grouping on top of that, okay? All right, and let me add, add a little bit more here. I like whenever I have rocks and plants that hit, one thing I found that's pretty cool when you hit like a ground plane is when water hits sand, it leaves like these little stripes in there. So I'll throw down a line like this and curve it like that. And then I'll throw another line just like a quarter of an inch outside of it like that. And it creates that weird illusion in terms of drawing that makes you feel like, hey, water could have been there or is the ground going into water? Or maybe it's a, some type of 
you know, like mud or sand or wind had blown and you see, it just acts as a, what it's all it's doing is really acting as a contour line to indicate that, hey, I'm hitting ground right here, okay? Now I did think of, I mentioned that leafy palm. Remember this guy here? So I wanna put him in next and then I'll wrap it up. I like those big fat leaves. But what I'm gonna do, you'll notice there's a wiggle on it a little bit. So looking at that right now, I'm gonna come over here Back the sketchbook. First, let me take my little note that I had here. Let me move that off to the side. Okay, like so. Oops. Let me move that. Come on, sketchbook. Over here. Good. And close that. And I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to find a way that um, maybe there's another, like a rock in here. And then something breaks out. And then I'm thinking right back here. I'm going to find a way to have that big palm tree. So um, I'm going to sketch the leaf. So this is what, when I looked at the leaf, what I just picked up a minute ago is a leaf comes out and has sort of a thin base. And then it has, it's almost like a big round ellipse. So if I come in here off that center line and I draw that round ellipse like that, that's what that leaf looked like, except for then it had these little curves on it like that. Right? So those were really important to me because then it had a leafing structure. And I'm going to go back and check my reference because I'm trying to remember, did the leafing structure branch off into the round parts? Meaning that did this, this vein, everything has veins. We have veins. By the way, our body is built off of a leafing structure as well. Same principle as almost all plants and living items. You go from one solid and then you break down. You go from ones and you go to twos and you go to threes and to fives. Okay, so that's the main, that's the one, and then this thing would break off, and then it looks like it goes into like twos, and that goes into like threes, and so on. So I want to check my reference and look, look at the veins in there. So you'll notice the veins, I look at a curved area, and the veins are landing, some of the veins are landing in the non, out in the curve that's going inside. Does that make sense? So a lot of the veins aren't landing on the outside of the curve. So I'm going to come in here and then realize, well, that's going to be pretty, that's what I was sort of thinking. And I was maybe a little bit off on that. That goes on to the outside, right? So I can erase that line. If I have a vein that comes, that vein's going to come in here and split into like this area here. There weren't really veins splitting off. So into this area, the outside curves. Those are the outside curves, right? So if I put a vein here, to come down it's going to flow into there and then the other thing I want to check is when does that vein split apart into twos and threes so I look over here it goes that's the main vein even it gets to the end and it splits you see that and then it goes off and right before the end it splits okay so there that gives me a little bit more reference on how to make sure I'm drawing my plants correctly so when we go out and sketch, those might be things that you look for. What is the main vein like? What kind of shape does the leaf feel like? And how does it work? So now that I got that one leaf in, that was my test leaf. If I were to come over here and draw another one flapping over like this, what am I going to do? I'm going to start the same way. I'm going to start with that center line, right? So then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to draw a big, round, fluffy, like oval shape, sort of. Let me draw through that, coming together like that. And then part of that is going to come down. And then once I get that vein, and that vein actually breaks up a little bit as it gets to the end, then I'm going to come in and then I'm going to add those rounded edges, right? So if you start to draw a leafy plant and you start like this on the edges, you're sort of setting yourself up maybe for a little bit of failure because you haven't thought about the construction and this overlapping flap and what's happening. So now it's a little bit easier for me to think like this having those round shapes in there, okay? And I know it sounds like I'm being very meticulous, but you know what? Meticulous drawing and sketching, these little facts are what make a difference in your sketch when somebody looks at them and they go like, hey, that feels really cool, or you know, that looks, your, your little computer in your brain takes a look at something and it goes, you know, that feels right to me. It looks correct, because if you ever, like, my wife is not, not artistic at all. She cannot draw. In fact, I pick out her clothes for her, okay? Um, she needs to see something on a mannequin to know what she wants, okay? 
but she can look at a leaf or a drawing and she can go, oh, that feels right or it feels off. Does that make sense? Yeah. She can do that because of her little computer in her head has seen leaves from all over, you know, and having plants or a garden or whatever. And she can sort of have a feeling like, hey, this matches or it doesn't match. So look, I just did that little study right there. In fact, thanks to the power of the computer, let's see what happens if I grab that, scale it down. I might decide to bring it over here. I might blend it in somehow, and I'm going to see if I can't get some type of a little structure like right here, a tree. Um, some type of a nice fluffy. Now, why is that bad right there? That's right, tangency, right? So I need to go back and think to myself, well, Phil, if you're going to use that, maybe I need to scale it down a little bit. Maybe I need to rotate it a little bit more. Maybe I have to have it at a little bit of an angle. And I might need to find a way. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is I copied it, put it in the computer's memory. I'm going to come back. Oops. Take my eraser right now. And I'm going to erase this little leaf I sketched in there because I realize that's going to create a major tangency for my grouping of plants. I'm going to hit paste. There's my paste. I'm going to sort of rotate this over a little bit. I'm going to throw that in right about there. And then I'm going to come in and finish sketching this little goofy plant here. But I'm going to come back look at my reference, and I don't really have much of a base to it, but I can see there's just a thick stem that comes in there. So I'm just going to sort of make it up, and I might bring this stem down a little bit more, and I might angle it in to the ground about here, and I might throw a couple contour lines on it to help give it a little bit more shape and form. And maybe as it even breaks in here, it's, this is, let me see over here, I had like a rock there on top of a big rock. I had a vine, a leaf. I might have another leaf coming out there. So I might have another like large rock to a small rock sitting out over here. And then I take part of that. And now I'm going to do the same thing. Let's throw a couple. I'm going to have the leaves down below here. Hold on, let me merge that layer down below. There it is. So I can erase this. Okay, so now I'm going to come in here I'm going to just throw a line in. I'm going to make these leaves a little bit smaller and then make them really nice and round and try to get them to fit in here pretty good. And then I'm going to round those edges like I just did before. Now right there, getting a little close to that tangency, so I'm going to keep that line in a little bit, which is fine. And then maybe this one's a little bit, comes up and out. It's a little bit more rounded. Maybe this one, there's overlap. The center's coming down here. And then it wraps in here. Okay. Let me throw another one coming out this way. I want one sort of coming here. I'm going to throw another big rock or something over here that sort of all brings us together. And I like the idea of one bending in the back here. Maybe I have to have another one falling back a little bit here as well. Okay, so I'm adding about four more in there. So let me address those real quick. Maybe this one to make it look different, it's a little bit shorter and squatty and more rounded in here like this. So I get that center line and I come in, I start rounding some of these edges and I get that to come in. There's that center line. I looked at the, the vein structure, have that branching off, going to the some of the little curved areas, right? And then I come back over here. Let's do the same thing. This is going to be, this one's going to have a lot of weight, like going down. So I'm going to draw underneath that, try to get that in there. And then I'm going to have that weight with that center line. So some of this is going to come back. And sort of go like that. That's the center of it, right? The center is going to sort of come up here. So I need to make sure I get that. If the center line's coming there, this center line needs to meet it in the middle and wrap, like right there. Okay, so then and the same thing here, get some of that veins to come off. Okay. And whenever I have an overlap of shape, sometimes like this, I just come in really lightly and I put a couple lines going across because that indicates to me that that's like the back leg 
for the back side view, you know. Okay. And then I had one more leaf sort of in the back there. Now, it's a little bit more complex to get that one in there, but I think it's going to be important just in terms of overlap. That just might be a little bit of a tip. Coming out like so. And then I might even just put a light hatch on that as well. Going across, it helps put that down a little bit, okay? All right, so that, that right there, to me, is that's one constant, that's a good group, okay? So I have, how many plants do I have in there? Total count. Technically, I have five because I have the vines. I put the vines in here, you know, and I could even do more with the vines because now I could come back to this. What if the vines that are growing here on the rock, those are plants, they have different leaves, right? What if the vine comes over and wraps around part of the tree like this? So if I erase some of that and then put those little, they're like little fingertips almost, they're like little knuckles going around part of that and then I put a little leaf coming off of that. And that resembles part of that vine, right? So that looks like the vine goes around there. Maybe the vine then comes around, goes this way comes around the back side here and maybe it overlaps right through the center of the plant, right? Like right here. Why not? That's how, to me, like really cool organics, that's how they feel. They sort of wrap around everything. And it's got a little leaf, a little leaf in there. It gets really busy in there, so I don't want to get too... And here where all the weight is, I'm going to put a big cut like right in there, going over part of that. Okay. So, see, I like that vine in there. I have a little leaf there. So I have, if I count them off right, I'll do this in red real quick. I have one plant here. I have another plant there. That's two. That's three, that's four, and then I have this structure here that's five with the rocks. So whenever I do groupings, just out of habit, not that you have to do primes all the time, but I sort of prefer to try to keep things in primed. I think they group together a little bit and they read a little bit easier, okay? Um, so just a suggestion, one threes, I mean threes and fives, right? Um, another thing too is, is I noticed some of you guys, when I looked at some of your sketches, some of you guys are doing a lot of this where you have the plant leaf coming up, right? And then you get to that bend point and then you bend it like that, right? And you have that overlap. Don't be afraid to show a leaf also being foreshortened because if a leaf comes like this from a side view and then that leaf breaks off, you might have more leaf on one side and then to foreshorten that, you just draw a thinner side on the other side. See, and that gives you the feel that it's the same side over here but it's just foreshortened over there. That's it. It's a great way to draw it. So you can, you know, if you want to, this is a great method of following that center line to make sure that your leaf overlaps itself, you know, and comes down. But then at the same time, when that leaf comes back together <coughs> and comes down, think about, you know, oh, maybe this leaf is tilted at an angle. So um, what's funny is in Maya, sometimes you can create leaves. They have them like little box structures. So if it's helpful for you to think about, you know, hey, I'm going to have a box here that's going to be turned this way, draw the box for it. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. If, and then maybe you come over here and you go, hey, I'm going to have a box that goes really high like this and then a small tip over, draw it like that. However it works for you, if that helps you isolate and figure out and then maybe we come over here and we have one that comes up and, and then it, it starts to overhang a little bit and drops towards me and then really drops. Then just draw the box shape, get in in the rough. Then come back in and add parts of those details, okay? So what I'm going to do is stop the recorder here.
render the video, we'll go upstairs to the artist in residence, and then I'll give you guys this video when I come back. But then when we come back, I'm gonna, I might, well, I might just finish this page to do a page with you, because I like drawing organics a lot. And um, to me, it's one of those things, there's beautiful trees at like local parks that have been around, and just nothing's better than drawing the, a really good, a really cool looking, great crooked tree that has weight, and it's huge and mass, like a big trunk and huge legs. And there's a couple all around here too, just right outside of this front door. Maybe I should walk outside and show you. There's one right next to us, you know, a 10 second walk right here that's absolutely amazing to look at, okay? All right, let me pause and I'll come right back. So I miss, I think it'll be really cool to do that little field trip, you know? So I think what I'm gonna do is we talked about tangencies already. I was just gonna stop this, but you know, I think I'm just going to keep sketching while you guys are working on in class for a little bit. And unfortunately, I can't play music because then if it gets on YouTube, YouTube won't let me put up the video. So.
that actually gives us some time because now that we have um, a little bit more time before we go out and draw, um, I actually allows me to add in a new attribute to the class that I sort of was waiting to do at the end. We're going to talk a little bit about drawing on toned paper and using some uh, markers and Prismacolor pencils are great sketching techniques for going outside. So um, I'm going to make sure what I'll do is I'll probably, four classes done today, I'm going to mention to you some supplies to get and you'll have about a week and a half, two weeks to get them. So that way when we go out to draw, you have these cool little elements that are, that are with you that are going to really aid to part of your, your sketching and your ability to produce. So if you look at what I'm doing here, I'm just continuing on another grouping. I have a thinner plant, and then I wanted to go for a really thick, heavy, broadleaf plant with a real thick base. And one of the things I'm thinking about is at home, I have one of those birds of paradise with a big, and they, they tend to grow up and they sprout. And even when you cut them down, you get like these leftover little protective like, um, the old, I don't know what to call it, like the old branches, once they're sliced off, they become a protective casing around the sort of circular base. So what I'm doing is I'm sketching up that circular base, and then I, I sketch in a couple of these little round elements around there, because sometimes par part of the old leaves, even they like hang off of that base, and what's cool is then you get like these new little like baby leaves coming in like this. So I'm going to sketch in here, and I'm going to do, instead of doing a lot of the gesture on this with a center line, I'm going to go in and just really quick try to throw in like a square leaf with a line down it like that, going for that plane effect. And then I'm this way, sometimes I like to work a little bit faster. This allows me to see a little bit more of what's happening by thinking of a leaf just being in like this square sort of shape like that. And it's just, and then once I get that square shape, boom, I throw a line a little bit on it like that, and then I could see the leaf happening. So as I come up here, I'm thinking, you know, one of the harder shapes to draw is foreshortened, something coming towards you. So I'm going to bring this leaf up here, and then knowing that that's the center line, I'm going to come up here, go to a square, and then bend that square in front of me like that. You see how I did that? That way I'm trying to give that effect. It's coming towards me a little bit. And then I'm going to come back over here. I have a nice spot here in the middle where I can get some really cool overlap, or I have maybe the base of a leaf coming this way. And I'm going to get a nice overlap right in here in the front and fit it like right in here. So if I look at part of that leaf, there's a center line, comes down the back, and it'll sort of fit right in there. And then I want to get a nice um, shape like this, like I'm looking underneath that leaf. So now it's turning a little bit away from me. So I'm going to angle off my plane a little bit more like that, curve it a little bit. And then I see how part of that might come back in here and connect into part of that bird of paradise, right? It's just observation, right? Paying attention to little things. And if I look at that, so I have one, two, three. I need some, some shapes behind there, so why not have another one that's coming over here? And this one's going to drop behind us like this. So let's get that square shape in there curving. Okay. So that other leaf is going to be right back in there. Okay. And then maybe there's a couple new ones coming out here. They're a little bit smaller in size. Like that. And... We'll go for another foreshortened plane in here. Okay, so it's cool. I could already see it happening, right? And then what I might do is, is since I have that in there, now it's just an issue of coming in and just really defining what that leaf's doing. So if I have a center line, that leaf's coming down here, it points a little bit, it breaks apart, and then comes down here like that. Actually, man, I was looking at my, my part of my tree I actually was walking my dogs from the backyard and I was they're going to to the bathroom because our pool's empty because I'm afraid they're gonna fall in the pool. I'm standing at my birds of paradise looking at them this morning and I was looking at all these like little baby leaves like popping out of them like they're ready to just 
start growing. I don't know if you've ever seen those plants before, but they really spread and they grow very, very quickly. And then they grow upward too. And just, they're always like producing lots and lots of like little leaves out of their What I'm going to do to finish part of this, sorry I'm not talking much, I'm just drawing. To finish part of this grouping is then I'm going to come over here and then I'll draw the outline. I'm going to draw one of those really short sort of leafy plants where the leaves are all about the same consistency. And I'm going to throw pretty much like a, a rock or two over here in the foreground. And then I'm going to fit this leaf plant here. I'll draw the outline of it. I'm going to get it to just overlay like right in there. See that? So I get a little bit of overlap happening. And then I'll erase part of what's in there. And that'll make a nice little grouping. Okay. 
okay. So I'll try not to get quite that far into there, but I'll keep it right about in this area here. Okay. Just a little bit so I don't have as much overlap in there. All right, I think I'll, so that's, I'm gonna stop my demo right there. One of the things that you can do, if you like to, it's a little bit more tedious, but, um, it's easier for me to do here in Sketchbook Pro. So let me show you is that if you wanted to, you can smear a little bit of your pencil behind your plants and it'll make them pop out a little bit. Does that make sense? So uh, an easy way to do that, you'll notice a lot of artists will do this little thing. Um, let me see if I can create another layer in here. And I don't know if, how well this might work, but if I just throw down actually just something like about there, okay? Trying to avoid tangencies, and let me see if that's what I hate about. I want to go back to Photoshop because some things are a little bit easier. So um, let me pause it, and I'll do it real quick. All right, so I just wanted to put everything on the page. I put the other sketches down below. So this is what I did in this demo for you guys. And um, what I like to do is I like to put a little tone block in the back of my sketches because then it makes the uh, three-dimensional shape and uh, form of your uh, plants and organic sort of pop off the page. It's just, it's just the principle of simple contrast, right? So, but it allows me to see my bushes a little clearer. And what, what's cool to me is it makes for a nice presentation page, you know, and that's half the battle when you're working for somebody on a project and you're developing a new world that has new organics, it has rocks, it has plants, it has all these really cool things. So. Anyway, this is it. Thanks for, uh, for, for, for waiting and watching and while I was, you know, sketching there and having to pause in between. But um, it's really a lot of fun. I mean, organics is just a, a really great way to, to, to make yourself better as an overall artist, to increase your draftsmanship. And, you know, there's just so much to learn about organic structures and plants and rocks and everything. So have fun and keep on drawing. Talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.